For the previous videos in this series, we used a Z80 microprocessor to generate a video display. Something that it wasn't explicitly designed to do, but something that the ZX80 and ZX81 took advantage of. Using a no-op generator, we tricked the CPU into executing no-ops while video data was being fetched from the main memory. But generating a jitter-free video signal requires precise timing down to a single clock cycle. In the first three videos, the 32 no-ops were laid out sequentially in memory and the program counter dutifully counted them out for us. We'd happily skip through the text using our program counter, which doubled as the raster counter, and we relied on this to generate the sync signals. In the fourth video, we broke this process in two. The program counter counted out some portion of the 32 no-ops in the display file, while the remainder of the 32 no-ops were counted out in our reference scan line. We had a call instruction in the middle, so we also had to take this into account in our scan line timing. I chose the call instruction as our end of line signal in our display file, but we know that the ZX80 and ZX81 use the halt instruction instead. The halt instruction has an opcode of 76 hexadecimal, which means bit 6 is set. This will also cause the no op generator to turn off, and the halt instruction will get executed by the CPU. Once in halt mode, we know the CPU just endlessly repeats no ops until it receives an interrupt. Either a regular software mask will interrupt, or a non mask will interrupt will end halt. Admittedly, Using the call instruction requires 3 bytes per line, while halt requires 1. This means the call methodology uses 50 more bytes of our precious 1k aesthetic RAM compared to halt. So, now using a display file, when we hit the last character in a row, we issue the halt instruction. This puts the CPU to sleep. But at some point down the track, we want to interrupt the CPU, exit halt and wake up our CPU to start executing code again. Houston, we have a problem. Our program counter stopped while the CPU is halted. This means we can't really use it as a raster counter anymore. We need precise timing here to make sure our sync signal occurs at a regular interval, otherwise we'll end up with jitter on the display. One way of waking up the CPU at precisely the right time might be to add some extra hardware to keep track of the clock cycles in this no-op period. I know that the number of clock cycles from the end of each sync to the start of the interrupt is 164, so we can work with that. Let's start with a binary counter, say a pair of 74HC161s, which count up, and we add some logic to interrupt the CPU at exactly the right time. Theoretically, this would work, but it may add an extra pound to the bill of materials. This would have cost old Sir Clive about £100,000 in profit, and I can't imagine he'd be too happy about that. So let's just park this idea for the moment. How are we going to manage this without adding extra hardware? I have a plan, sir. Really, Borick? A cunning and subtle one? Yes, sir. As cunning as a fox who's just been appointed Professor of Cunning at Oxford University? <laughs> yes, sir. Remember, the Z80 wants to keep refreshing any dynamic RAM that might be attached, even during halt. To do this, it should keep incrementing the memory refresh register for the entire time the CPU is halted. Well, in fact, it does, and this is part of the instruction definition. This led to one of the greatest architectural hacks of the 8-bit era, and I mean hack in a good way. During the hold period, the program counter is stopped, but the memory refresh counter keeps running. Let's say the memory refresh register randomly holds the value of DF hexadecimal at the start of a scan line. From the CPU's perspective, the text gets converted to no ops. Then at this point, we hit the halt instruction, the program counter stops, but the memory refresh register keeps on going. Now, if we were lucky enough to start with DF in the memory refresh register at the start of the scan line, it should be rolling over from FF to 80 hexadecimal right at about the time that we want to exit halt. 
Remember that it's only the lower seven bits of the refresh register that are actually counting. Let's have a look at bit 6 of the refresh register count, which is output on address bus signal A6 during the refresh cycle. We see that it's going low right at about the time that we need to interrupt our CPU. So here's a crazy idea. Let's connect up A6 to our interrupt line. Remember, this is all predicated on the memory refresh register having the value of DF at the start of the scan line. But isn't this just a free running counter? Couldn't it contain any random value at the start of a scan line? Well, it turns out the Z80 has an instruction for copying the value in the accumulator over to the memory refresh register. This way, we can precisely control the value in the memory refresh register at the start of the scan line. This idea of connecting A6 to interrupt might just work. Now you might be thinking, what if address bit 6 of the program count is low? Won't this cause a spurious interrupt that could upset the whole apple cart? Especially if the display file starts at location 8000 hexadecimal, where A6 is clear. It turns out, the Z80 only samples the interrupt and NMI signals when exiting HALT on the transition from T3 to T4. This is when the value in the memory refresh register is being presented on the address bus. If the program counter happens to cause the address line A6 to go low, this will happen in T1 and T2, and no interrupt will occur. Surely they wouldn't have been crazy enough to do this. Oh yes, they would. How exactly do we make the memory refresh register contain DF for the first byte of the display file? This is the actual code from the Z80 ROM. The A register already contains the value DD hexadecimal. We copy DD into the refresh register. From what I can tell, this load occurs at the end of the refresh cycle instead of the increment. The next instruction enables the interrupt, and the refresh register will contain DD hexadecimal. This is incremented after the refresh cycle. We read the opcode for jumped HL, and the refresh register will contain DE. It's incremented. We perform the jump so that at the first location in our display file, the refresh register contains DF hexadecimal. Bingo. One of the clever things about using the refresh register to act as our raster counter is that no matter where the halt is, the interrupt will always occur at the same time, and this sequence always takes 149 clock cycles. The first series of no-ops are from the no-op generator while we step through the display file, while the second series of no-ops are from the halt instruction, and they continue until we exit halt. Performing the interrupt itself takes 13 clock cycles, and we'll go over that in more detail in the next video. It's dynamite on paper. Of course, the people who came up with the numbers on the paper aren't here. I want to see exactly how this works in hardware so I'm going to recruit our old friend from the first video. I've connected up some LEDs to the address bus, data bus, and some control signals. So provided I have the ability to clock it slowly and film it, then this setup is kind of a poor man's logic analyzer. First, I have blue LEDs on the address lines, which are active high. These signals go through current limiting resistors, and the cathode on the LEDs are connected to ground. I have red LEDs on the data lines, which are also active high, and these are connected to LEDs in a similar way. But the green LEDs on the control signals are active low, so they connect through a resistor to a LED, which has its anode tied to 5 volts. This means the green LEDs will go on when the signal goes low. Now, I suspect that not everyone likes to work this way, and that's understandable. But for me personally, I make fewer mistakes when I can see when a signal is asserted and not worry about the actual voltage. Back to the ZX80, I'm going to make a few modifications to the display file to make it a bit easier to study on the breadboard. First, I'm going to remove the leading halt instruction, which is used to generate the upper vertical blanking period. The breadboard itself currently doesn't have a no-op generator, which is a bit of a pain, but then again, it also doesn't have a shift register. So what I'm going to do is change all the text back to spaces which has a character code of zero hexadecimal. 
Conveniently, this corresponds with the no-op instruction, but I'll leave all the halts in place. I've labelled all the signals, but when we just let it run freely, it's a little tricky to understand the output of the machine by just looking at the LEDs. That's because the CPU interleaves the instruction fetch cycle and the refresh cycle, and this gets very confusing very quickly. To make it more understandable, I'm going to separate out the instruction fetch and refresh cycles using video editing in post-production. The previous sequence now looks like this. We can see both the instruction fetch and refresh cycles counting up. When we get to 8010 hexadecimal, we can see opcode 76 being fetched, which is the halt instruction. When I restart the sequence, we see that the program count has stopped, but the memory refresh counter keeps on going up. So at least the basic premise for this idea seems to work. Note that the refresh register wasn't preloaded, and the E in the upper byte of the refresh address comes from the interrupt register, and it's used to point to the character set in the ROM. Now let's look at an actual scan line. This time, at location A1000, the refresh register contains DF. We run it up to 8010. We can see the halt being fetched. The program counter stops, but the refresh counter keeps on going. The refresh register just rolled over to 80 hexadecimal, so bit A6 will be low, which should trigger an interrupt. And there we go. The machine just jumped to location 0038, which is the interrupt service routine for Mode 1 interrupts. I'll be going over interrupts in more detail in the next video. Then we find ourselves at the start of the next scan line at location A1000 with DF in the refresh register. This is exactly what we'd expect. From a display file perspective, we just scan through once, halt, then perform an interrupt, and we start the same line again. Now let me play it without pausing it. Start. Halt instruction. Interrupt. Next scan line. I think I'll end this video here, but it's crazy that we've just spent an entire video analyzing one wire on a schematic diagram. See you in the next video.